Okay, then let's look at the extrusion of polymers using extruders. Okay. The meaning of the word extrude is to push out. So we push the material out, we, we melt them and then push it out from the machine. So that is the meaning of the word extrude. Normally in extrusion process, what will happen is that a material is forced by an extruder through an orifice shaped die to create a product. Okay, and extruded of constant cross section, right? So that is no, how, no, how normally the extruders work actually. So we just use some solid polymer and then after that, we just uh, melt that material inside the, the processing chamber or the, within the extruder barrel and then after that we push it out. So that is how extruders work. So we're going to look at that in, in detail. In addition to the polymeric material, there are several other materials or products are being manufactured using extrusion processes. Some examples could be some metals extrude into some sort of wires, okay, and the, some ceramics also being extruded into some shapes, okay, some food stuff like pasta, sausages, or the cereals, they are also extruded using a special type of food processing extruders, right? The extruders are not only for polymer processing, it could be for metals, ceramics, and also for some particular food processing applications as well. So as I mentioned you before, usually the polymers are extruded at the solid state, okay, with the polymer being fed into extruder as a particulate solid, it could be in the powder form or pellet or uh, the, 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 uh, the granule form, and then that material is melted within the extruder and then after that push it out uh, to the die to get in the desired shape. As we discussed already, the normal in polymer processing, we just feed the solid material into the machine and then after that it become molten and then we can push it into a die. Okay, so the, therefore this process is termed plasticating extrusion. So what is the meaning of plasticating is that is the conversion of plastic granules to a flow able melt. Right, it was uh, the, the plastic materials which were in solid form and then converting it into a flowable melt is known as a, uh, the plastication process. Okay, so normally in extruders, melt is plasticating and then that melt can be used to form different shapes as we need. In industry, there are a number of different type of extruders. Of these type of extruders, single extruder, extruder is the most commonly used type. So therefore, I'm going to concentrate on single extruder extrusion within this, uh, the, the lesson actually. As I mentioned before now, you can see uh, the, the classification of extruders into different types. So discontinuous extruders, continuous extruders, okay? And then uh, you could see the continuous extruders. Again, you can just uh, break that into uh, three different categories. Multi-screw, it could be more than one screw. Single screw extruders, okay? That is the most commonly used machine in uh, the plastic processing industry. And disc, disc and drum extruders, okay? That is another type actually. Then if you look at the multi-screw extruders, we can classify that into two different categories as intermission screws or non-intermission screws. Or, and likewise, so there, there could be several other categories uh, that we can classify those extruders into. Right, so let's look at what is the main difference between continuous and discontinuous extruders. The continuous means actually utilizing a rotating member such as a screw, okay, and achieves a continuous output of materials. If you can provide the material continuously, that means the solid material into the machine continuously, so then you can have a continuous output. So that is the idea, okay? So then output is continuous as long as we feed the material into the machine, okay? Then the discontinuous type is a bit different. It's like a reciprocating motion, okay? Those type of extruders operates in a cyclic pattern and makes use of the reciprocating member in order to transport materials, okay? Like injection molding. So they produce some certain amount of melt, uh, we call short size, for example. So then once the, once the desired amount of melt is being uh, just formed or created within the machine, so that amount will be just pushed into a die or just uh, they push out of the mach machine by a reciprocating member, so they, they, then we can use it. So this can happen like a continuous cycle. So it is being pushed and then again, the, the member goes back and then the next shot will be ready uh, when we need uh, to have the next shot to produce the next product, okay? So you can understand the, now the difference between the, the continuous type means we can provide uh, output continuously, but for the discontinuous type that we can control, it will provide uh, the material time to time or uh, with some certain uh, the frequency uh, as we just set it up. So kind of good example would be uh, the, uh, the injection molding machine, it has a reciprocating screw and also it has a, uh, the rotary motion as well, okay? So here I'm going to just uh, look at uh, the single screw extruders used in polymer processing. 
Here you can see some extra information relating to uh, some sort of basic uh, the extruder types, the continuous screw extruders, the continuous disc or drum extruders, the discontinuous reciprocating extruders, right? So you could just uh, read through this, and then here you could see some other important information relating to those type of extruders. So now I'm going to look at the specific components of a single screw extruder. Here you can see the arrangement of a single extru extruder. So I'm going to explain uh, the, the part by part so then you can understand uh, their function and why they are important actually. So here you can see the feed hopper. So this is the place that we just call uh, the feed in the material into the machine. Okay, so you can see that it's a gravity feed actually. Once you just fill the material into this hopper, so it will just uh, the force into the into the, the chamber or in this case into the barrel uh, through the gravity. Okay, so there could be some kind of force feeders as well. So you can just uh, the push the material, okay? And then we can control the feed rate, but here it's completely depend on the gravity. So then as material is just being taken out from the machine from here, so then the, the new material will be pushed in or dragged into the machine uh, from this point. Okay, hope, hope it is clear, right? So then uh, the, we, this is what we call the feed throat. Okay, so that feed throat is really important again. So sometimes we can just uh, control the temperature in the feed throat. Okay, or we can cool it down as well. So we, we don't, don't want any material to be molten at this point. Okay, so we want to have them in the solid state so then they can convey easily along the screw. Right, so therefore in some uh, the extruders there could be the feed throat cooling as well. Right, so we have to maintain the temperature to make sure that proper conveying takes place across the along the screw actually. So this is the extruder barrel actually. So it's, it has a certain thickness. So the thickness of this barrel could be uh, two or three centimeters sometimes. Okay, so there could be a pressure generation inside the machine while it is being working. So the pressure could be 50, 60 bars or even higher depending on the size of the extruder. So therefore we have to have uh, uh, the barrel that can support that certain amount of pressure. Okay, and this is a smooth barrel surface, but there could be some new extruders comes with some grooved barrel as well to promote the melting and the conveying of the material. So here we have the electrical resistance, uh, the band heaters. So if it is a, uh, the circular barrel, so then we can have some cartilage heaters that we can wrap around, wrap around the barrel. Okay, so we can open it like this and then place it and then close it or clamp it. So we, we call them cartilage heaters, so then we can wrap them around the barrel Depending on the length of the extruder, so there could be a number of uh, different heater bands or the heating zones uh, the, along the extruder barrel. Okay, so the heaters could be within the, along the barrel or it could be within the, the dies or in the other units as well as we have to maintain the temperature profile in axial direction uh, to, to ensure the proper conveying of the material or the proper melting of the material. So this is the screw that is the main component of the machine actually. It has a function of conveying the material and also converting the material from solid state to uh, the molten state while it is being conveyed along the screw, right? The screw is having a normally uh, specific uh, the design. So normally in this in this zone we call it the feed zone. Uh, the, you could see that these grooves or the channel depths are high. Okay, so then channel depth is gradually decreasing as it is going through uh, this direction. Okay, that is what it normally happens. I'm going to show you some real screws used in industrial applications uh, in incoming slides actually. Here it's the drive. Drive means the unit that we use to rotate the, or the turn the screw. So it, it could be a DC motor or AC motor. It could be a hydraulic drive. So the most commonly used was for small extruders is the direct current motors. But nowadays it could be uh, AC motors or uh, the vector control AC motor drives uh, could be used uh, it, with some extruders. Okay, so normally that could be a gearbox um, uh, between the, the, the screw and the drive, but in, in uh, new extruders comes with a direct drive as well. That means that the motor shaft is directly connected to the screw, but uh, it is not that common. So most of the time there could be a transmission or the gearbox between the, uh, the motor and the screw. Yeah, so we have to use the, uh, the thrust bearing if you have uh, the transmission unit. Uh, so then uh, the, we can smoothly uh, the transmit the, the, the uh, rotation between the drive and the motor, right? So then the breaker plate actually, the so here you can understand that as the molten material comes along this way now, so while the screw is being rotating, so then it has a swirl motion, okay? So it has a rotating motion or swirl motion at this position, but we need to have a linear flow of material that is coming out of the, uh, the barrel. 
Okay, so therefore the breaker plate can be used uh, to convert the rotary motion of the melt into a linear motion. Okay, and also uh, as we place this, it could cause to create some extra pressure uh, at this position as well. Of course, it is just blocking the flow. Uh, it has only small holes, so therefore that would increase the, the pressure inside the chamber as well. And then the screen packs are also being used. So before the breaker plate, we use something called a screen pack. So that is mostly to just uh, the, the, uh, the purify the, the molten material. If there's an impurities or unmelted particle, the screen pack is stop them uh, without being pushing into the dye actually. Here we don't want any unmelted particles or any impurities to come out of the machine. So therefore the screen pack is just uh, there to just make sure that uh, to stop those type of unnecessary materials or undesired materials. Okay, so again, this will create some extra pressure because it is being placed here and trying to block the flow and also trying to control the flow here. Okay, sometimes uh, this screen pack should be changed time to time. Uh, it could just uh, the, create some uh, the blockages of the material as the accumulation of the material on top of that. So there, therefore we have to uh, replace the screen pack or clean it up time to time to maintain the proper operational conditions. And then this is the die. So die Die is the unit which we form the material into the desired shape. Okay, within the die, there's a cavity. The cavity is the shape of the product that we need to manufacture using the molten polymer. So then cooling fans here. So here we have to maintain the temperature actually. So, so if you discuss about the axial temperature profile, normally what we do is that, so we have the lowest temperature in this, uh, this zone. So okay, in here we have the normally solid materials. So we don't want early melting of the solid material. So then we normally set a low temperature in this region. Okay, so for example, it's 150, 170, 200 and 220. Okay, so that will ensure the proper, uh, the convenience of the material. So that means it will just make sure that proper, the frictional heat generation and viscosity dissipation as well during this zone. Okay, therefore the selection of the set temperature is also important during the process. Okay, so, but we want to maintain the barrel temperature. So therefore uh, there could be cooling pans. Okay, this might not work continuously, but let's say we set the temperature to be like uh, the 200 degrees at some place or 170 degrees at here. So then if it is just exceeding that value, these cooling pans will automatically turn on and then try to maintain the temperature. Actually here, there are something called PID controllers uh, to look at the temperature. Okay. If the temperature of these heater bands going beyond the set value, so these could just turn on. Actually, one of the issue is that, so we have set this temperature to be 170, but there could be some internal heat generation as well. So therefore we have mainly three main modes of heat mechanisms, the, the conductive heat through this, uh, the heaters and also frictional and viscous heat dissipation inside the barrel. So therefore we don't know actually, uh, the temperature is going to be the same value as we set uh, outside the barrel. Okay, for some reason, if the temperature is going beyond the set value due to the, the extra addition of the heat inside the machine, so these are uh, the, the cooling pans can turn on and then cool it down to the desired value again. Then the process monitoring is also really important aspects. We can use some thermocouples, pressure sensors in different locations to observe the temperature and pressure uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the process. So as I mentioned you before, the screw is the main component of the machine. It, it has three main functional or geometrical zones. Okay, the first zone I mentioned you that is the solids conveying or the feed section. So you can see that here the channel depth is reasonably higher compared to the, uh, the, the melting zone or the melt conveying zone. And then the second after the solids conveying or feed section, so we'll have the compression section or the plastication section or others you call it melting section. So here you could see that the channel depth is gradually the decreasing or it is just try to uh, get uh, the smaller clearance between the barrel and the screw surface here. So then the finally we have the melt mixing or melt pumping section or sometimes we call it the, the metering section. In this zone we have the shallowest channel depth. Okay, it's it's over here. We, we cannot just indicate some ex exact uh, the, the boundaries for these uh, the zones but they are really indicative the, the first feed zone, the compression zone and the, the mixing zone. Ideally in the, in the feed section, material should stay uh, the solid while absorbing the heat and then melting should start at this point. And then as the material reach into this position, so they should be fully molten. So then finally those material can mix and then we can uh, the pump them out from the machine actually. Actually the screw is trying to control all of those actions 
and there are a number of different type of screw geometries are used in industry so depending on the type of the material sometimes you have to just uh, the select the suitable uh, the type of screw and also screws could be in different arrangements this is a really most common and conventional type used in industrial applications but nowadays there are some new screw designs like barrier plated screws so they have different arrangements of these uh, the channels or the grooves okay so i can show you some of them in the coming slides this video provides a nice explanation on the functional zones of an extruder. The simplest screw design has three zones. The feed zone, the compression or transition zone, and the metering zone. The feed zone has the deepest flight depth, allowing the greatest volume of granules to fall into this zone. It's where plastic melting begins. Next is the compression or transition zone. This zone has gradually decreasing flight depth. The compression zone is where melting of the plastic pellets should be completed. The last zone is the metering zone. It has the least flight depth and so is the most restrictive to flow. In this zone, the plastic should be thoroughly mixed and should be at a uniform temperature. The ratio of the flight depth in the feed zone to the flight depth in the metering zone is called the compression ratio. The compression ratio affects the melting ability and the output of the screw. Typical compression ratios for thermoplastic screw designs are from 2 to 1 to 3 and 1 half to 1. Thermoset injection molding screws have little or no compression ratio. And also this video provides a nice explanation on the extrude operation as well. Now let's look at the inside of an extruder to see how it works. The plastic raw material in this hopper travels by gravity to the feed throat and drops onto the rotating screw. The rotation of the screw conveys the plastic forward through the heated barrel. As the plastic is conveyed forward along the screw, the channel depth decreases, forcing the plastic through a smaller area. The combination of compression and screw rotation causes friction, which generates heat. This is called shear heating. This heat, along with the heat from the barrel heating system, melts the plastic. By the time the plastic is conveyed to the end of the screw, it should be well mixed and at a proper temperature and pressure needed by the die. The plastic is called a melt at this stage. Beyond the screw, there can be a screen pack. The screen pack is a set of wire mesh filters that the plastic must flow through. The screens are typically from 20 to 100 mesh which indicates the wires per inch. The screen pack is supported by a breaker plate, which is a sturdy metal plate with many holes for the plastic to pass through. The screen pack filters contaminants from the melt. The screen pack must be set in place with a coarsest screen next to the breaker plate, so each screen can support a finer one. Otherwise, the pressure difference may break the fine wires, contaminating the product and possibly doing permanent damage to the die. Here you can see that some of the common screw designs are used in current industry actually. So this is what we call a gradual compression screw. Here you could see that the D indicates the diameter of the screw actually. So all of these screws are 63.5 millimeter in diameter. Right, and also the SCD refers to screw channel depth. Okay, so if you just remember that in the previous video, uh, the, they discuss about the channel depth here. In the feed zone, the channel depth you could see that is 10.53 millimeters for this screw, and then uh, in the, the metering zone, it is 3.46 millimeters only. So you can clearly see that the channel depth in the metering zone is the lowest uh, compared to the feed the zone actually. Okay, the channel depth uh, in the compression zone also gradually decreasing as well, right? 
So here the D indicates uh, the, the diameter. So you could see that the length of each zone here, the feed zone or solids conveying zone, and then compression zone, and here the metering zone, right? The feed zone is uh, the four times of diameter in length, and then the compression zone is 10D in length, and then uh, the metering zone also 10D in the length. So it has a gradual compression. Okay, it's not like a rapid, it has a gradual compression zone. So that is why it's called as a gradual compression screw. So if you remember in the previous videos, they were talking about the compression ratio, okay? So in the compression zone, as I mentioned a while ago, so it has a decrease in channel depth, okay? Or the channel depth is gradually decreasing, but the channel depth in the feed zone and the metering zone are quite constant, okay? So the ratio between the feed zone's channel depth and the metering zone channel depth we call is the the compression ratio of a screw, right? Sometimes depending on the some certain conditions like material type, we have to select a screw with the proper compression ratio, right? So this is a gradual compression screw. So it is gradually just compressing the material along this length actually. So then the second one we call is a rapid compression screw. So then you could see that. So it, it is a rapid melting zone or very quick melting zone. So it has only a length of two diameters of the screw, right? So here also the feed zone, you could see that is 10.53 millimeters, same as this one. And then the metering zone has uh, the 3.5 millimeters should be exactly similar to this, but okay. The main difference between them two is that the length of the compression or the melting zone, right? The gradual compression, and this is a rapid compression. So you can recognize the difference between them, right? So this screw might not be used for some certain material. Okay, so because it has a very short, uh, the, the, uh, the compression zone, so therefore you have to be carefully select the screw depending on the conditions related to the process actually. Right, the third one, we call it uh, the barrier plated screw. Okay, it has a different uh, type of uh, the channel arrangement as you can see here in the feed zone, uh, the channel depth is 12.19 uh, millimeters here for this one. And then here you can see a special type of arrangement we call barrier plied. Okay, so you can see it here clearly. So it has a dual channel. Okay, so that means uh, that zone or the, this screw can just separate the molten material and the unmelted particle into two different channels actually. So that is the idea here. Okay, in addition, uh, compared to these two type of screws, it has a mixer at the end, the mixing element. Okay, so we call it a Maddox mixer. And also the channel depth is in this zone is, is relatively higher compared to these two. It's, it's greater than maybe 1.4 millimeters compared to these two. It is it is 4.9 millimeters, the channel depth in the metering zone, right? And also you could see, compare the length here. This is five diameters, 13 D and then six D. Here the longest is the compression zone. So if you want to compare the melting performance of these three screws, so based on some of my experiments, the, as I discussed some of the results in the last uh, the week in the Wednesday morning as well. So the barrier plated screw is having a better melting performance compared to this, uh, the gradual compression and rapid compression screws. Okay, so you can see that the compression ratios here, three to one for the GC screw. So that means that the 10.53 divided by 3.46, is just, you could say it is the, the three to one, the same for the rapid compression screw as well. So here 12.19 divided by 4.9 will give you 2.5 uh, to one compression ratio for the barrier plated screw. Okay, so these are the common type of screw designs used in industry. If you compare the prices of these screws actually, the barrier plated screw is slightly expensive compared to these two. Okay, so these are conventional screw design types and this is a kind of relatively new screw design. And also there are some other new designs recently introduced uh, to the industrial applications as well, uh, depending on the new type of materials and also to improve the melting performance or the conveying performance of the material. In this slide, you can see some of the product manufactured using extrusion. Okay, you could see how big these machines could be, right? Okay, so you can see the size of the product. Uh, it could be uh, the few meters of diameter and also thickness could be the, uh, the five, six centimeters as well. Okay, for this scale machine, you have to provide uh, the hundreds of kilograms of material per minute uh, to produce this big structure or this big pipe actually. Okay, here you can see some metal wires with coating and also here you can see multiple wires with coating. Again, it has uh, another common coating and also this example of another, uh, the electrical wire. So which number of different layers and then all are being made using extrusion actually. If you want to create or manufacture this type of special type of structures, the main element that you have to change is the die of the machine. Okay, the rest of the machine is quite the same. 
only difference is the size okay but uh, the main element here if you want to just uh, change the design into different formats is the change in the die okay so for example now here this is a special type of die to manufacture the pipes okay so this is also a small scale pipe coming out from extrusion machine so here you can see the complete arrangement of extrusion line so this is the motor that i discussed before and then there could be a gearbox inside and then gear is connected uh, with the screw inside the barrel and this is the control unit and this is the the, the feed hopper okay and then here you could see uh, the screw extruder barrel is just uh, the uh, the wrapped with some sort of insulation to minimize the heat loss to the surrounding and then these are the cooling pans that i mentioned before so it has four cooling pans and also here you could see the four different temperature zones uh, the here one two three four here you can clearly so uh, you see them and here there is a clamp ring and then it is been connected to the die here okay so all of these zones should have a, a different heat to maintain the, the required temperature okay and then there are some other interesting uh, the cross sections or the arrangements manufactured using extrusion and, and also here you can see some kind of uh, the complex geometries extruded uh, through extrusion machines so this could be even metal as well so you can use uh, the metal extrusion and also uh, the but it has a different arrangement compared to polymers so this is what i mentioned you before as the blown film extrusion so which is used to uh, manufacture uh, the thin films for packaging applications okay and here also we have a special type of die and also we have to use a compressed air line to pressurize the bubble to uh, to maintain or to control the the desired properties of the the film okay so this is a good indication of uh, how important extrusion processes and also how important polymeric materials nowadays so uh, which is being named as the the material of the 21st century right